On this episode of What the Ship, the Ukrainian grain deal is in jeopardy. Oakland strike closes the port. Europe's container supply threatening the global supply chain. Old fuel is the best fuel. And finally, watch out for that whale. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercaglano. Welcome to this, the July 26th edition of What the Ship, the weekly news source from what's going on with shipping, where we recap the top five stories in the maritime sector. Got a lot to talk about today. We're going to jump right into it. But first, a quick update on a story we did regarding the APL Vanda. So I did a video on this vessel, particularly the APL Vanda. This is a vessel that experienced uh, rough seas crossing from the Far East across the Indian Ocean heading toward the Suez, and the vessel reported losing 55 containers. This is in early July. The vessel has been in Djibouti since then, and CMA CGM, which is the parent company for APL, has been very quiet on releasing information regarding this vessel. They have already announced the cancellation of the Southampton stop, but the vessel was scheduled to be transiting the Suez Canal a few days ago. Well, the vessel had not left Djibouti, and has now finally left Djibouti, but now is heading for an unscheduled stop at the port of Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. It is fairly obvious that more has happened on board this vessel than just the loss of 55 containers. They have su suffered probably multiple stack collapses. I have not been able to find a photo and image of this vessel at all. Anybody finds one, just send them my way. Let me know. But we haven't been able to see much. But it sounds like they're heading to Jeddah to offload part of the cargo, restack, resort. Obviously, the facility in Djibouti wasn't sufficient enough to do it, just enough to get them temporarily cleared so that they can head up to Jeddah before they can clear the Suez Canal. Again, I go back to this issue about shipping companies providing information. I'm not sure why CMA CGM is not providing information more to their shippers. I keep hearing it from it, from their shippers, that they're not hearing anything from them. So perhaps we should do a little better job there on customer service, CMA CGM, and let everybody know what the deal is with the APL Vanda. Again, the number of containers that fall overboard are are minuscule, like 0.0001% every year. So it's not a big issue. It is, of course, substantial if it's your cargo and if it has an environmental impact. But in terms of reliability, we, we don't see it too much. But these large container vessels in particular have been suffering these large container uh, collapses. And it appears as if APL, uh, which is the company under CMA CGM, doesn't want to get that information out. All right, we're going to go ahead and jump into our top five stories. If you hadn't done so yet, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into story number one. So if you follow the channel, you know I did two videos this week on the situation in Ukraine. The first one was based on the UNCTAD reports. This is the UN conference on trade, and they had done uh, two great reports on why Ukrainian grade is so important. And I did that video, and then literally that day, the video got out. They signed the deal in Turkey between Ukraine and Russia with the UN brokering it to resume trade of Ukrainian grain. Great, fantastic news. And within 24 hours, Russia strikes the port of Odessa. And so there are a lot of questions about what's going on. Series of stories right here that are breaking down elements of this. Uh, here's a Bloomberg story, which highlights a very important issue is one of the first hurdles is to get the vessels that are on the berths in these ports off the berths. Ships have been sitting there since February. Some of these vessels have been abandoned by the crews. The crews have been taken off. Uh, ships that don't run for a long period of time have a hard time getting back up and running. Not to mention the fact that some of these vessels are loaded with grain, which is probably rotten and spoiled by now from being loaded on board, but not sure. You're going to have to clear those vessels off. Now, they can tow these vessels off, anchor them out in anchorages, obviously, and clear the berths. But the problem is there are about uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 large vessels up along the berths here that need to be cleared. There's a total of about 100 vessels here, but I'm talking about large, uh, larger uh, seagoing vessels here. You also see this story here. This is the Reuters story, which is issuing another element here. This deals with Russian ships stealing Ukrainian grain. I think one of the reasons that the Russians really want to see the resumption of Ukrainian grain shipments is so that their own grain shipments do not come into question. They're doing something called STS, ship-to-ship -ship transfers. 
So they're transferring ship to ship out in anchorages. And what we're seeing is grain, fuel, all these things being done out in the open ocean and in bays and anchorages outside of sight of everybody so that they can move the food and fuel around and so lose the track of, of the ownership. Uh, this is where groups like tank trackers come in who monitor this through open source intelligence, through not just AIS, but also through satellites. Uh, and what we're seeing here is 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 this what what uh, uh, Alyssa uh, Sp uh, Sporer over at Freightwaves called grain laundering, and this is based on a story out of Windward, who's really been watching this closely. If you want to really want to follow the heart of this story, if you want to go directly to the source, Windward is the one that's been doing this, and they've been tracking these grain shipments here. And what we're seeing here is that this is the Black Sea dark activities by bulk carriers flying the Russian or Syrian flag. And you can see how this spike is going up. This is one of those ship to ship transfers that they're talking about. This is with three cargo vessels and two service vessels involved. And you can see them out. This is, again, open source intelligence satellites. Finally, the last story here is all eyes are on Chornmorsk. I know I butchered that. I apologize. My Ukrainian is ter terrible. Uh, for signs of grain movement. This is one of the three ports that are in the agreement, Odessa being the other one, and another one I'm not even going to try to announce. But this is one of the larger grain shipment terminals here. This is just south of Odessa. It's about uh, uh, between Odessa and the Danube River. And this port will be a major player if they can resume grain shipments out. So a lot of hurdles to overcome. Now, the attack on Odessa, the Russians are claiming they hit a patrol boat and a harpoon missile storage site. The images don't quite show that. The Russians say they do. My point of concern here is this is extremely close, within 200 meters of the grain facilities in Odessa. When you're loading grain, you have fine mist of dust in the air. You can't have open flames, let alone explosions going on if you want this to work. There are tons of hurdles to get through. And again, if you're interested in that, I did an interview with USNI News, which I'll have in the show notes, but also you can go to the video I did that kind of breaks this down. All right, let's jump over to story number two. Story number two takes us to the port of Oakland, California, where truck, truck workers are protesting against the California law known as AB5. California has a series of trucking laws that have massive impacts, not just on the state of California, but on national shipping. And in particular, I'm really surprised California is able to get away with a lot of this because of its impact on interstate commerce, which is usually how the federal government gets in. AB5, which was initially intended to legislate against Lyft and Uber, they were able to fight it and get themselves off. But now independent truckers find themselves in the crosshair where if they're not working for a larger firm, then they're not going to be able to operate and basically move loads out of the ports. And so what you saw was a strike outside the port of Oakland. And it effectively shut down the port of Oakland. Now, understand Oakland has been having problems for the whole time during the supply chain crisis. They had pad performance, which forced a lot of shipping companies to just focus on LA and Long Beach and shut Oakland out entirely. Oakland had been the port where a lot of American exports came out. A lot of our recyclables and trash went out of Oakland over to China. They stopped receiving that a few years ago. So that cut down. But a lot of American agricultural exports come out of Oakland. And Oakland's just been having a difficult time in really dealing with the supply chain crisis. Every time they come back up, they get knocked back down again. And this is another one example of this. This is a story over at Maritime Executive, talks about the same thing, talks about this. What's going to be interesting about this AB5 protest is whether the ILWU agrees to the protests. Uh, there was initial talk that they were going to honor the, the strike and not cross it. Then they, they did cross it. Uh, but what if this strike or this protest comes down to LA and Long Beach? That has the potential to cause even more problems because if it expands to the larger ports of LA and Long Beach, that could mean massive ramifications for the supply chain. All right, let's jump over. This is a Lorianne LaRocco story over in Freightways Viewpoint. Why Europe is so important to the empty container supply? Blank sailings in Europe will add to capacity constriction. I got a video that's going to be dropping this week, later on, the end of the week, 
on container ships and the routes they travel. How big are the container ships operating on the routes, average size? How many containers are moved? And then the, the uh, percentages of the large alliances, how much do they control? So that story is going to play very nicely into this story. But this story I found really interesting for a variety of reasons, not the least of which she's talking about how the strikes in Europe is really causing impacts across the entire supply chain. So one of the things that they she has developed along with CNBC and a few other outfits is this. This is what they call their supply chain heat map. It shows you where there is congestion in the maritime supply chain. Six ports in Europe. You'll see here vessel schedule, time in port, trucks, container availability, and then total. Notice two ports, Bremerhaven and Hamburg, both in Germany, which are suffering strikes right now, are in the red, indicating congestion. Rotterdam, Antwerp, these are in the low countries, Rotterdam, Netherlands, Antwerp, Belgium, also moderate congestion. And then the two ports in England, Liverpool and Felixstowe are in the green, but they're ticking toward moderate congestion, especially with potential for maybe a strike in Liverpool uh, looming on the horizon. So Europe is having a lot of problems. When you look at the video I'm doing now that's gonna be up later this week, you'll see the important role of Europe as a hub for containers coming over to the United States. Uh, go over here, again, you're looking at those shipping rates uh, and how the rates are going, the spot rate in terms of numbers. Here you're seeing the different rates, China to East Coast, China to West Coast, and you're seeing this, the, 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 the uh, dips and spikes, how they're basically have plateaued since then, but well above pre-pandemic levels. Again, I keep using the analogy, we've been up to the top of Everest and now we've come down the backside, but we're not down the sea level yet. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The supply chain in the United States, where you're seeing the red, Oakland and Savannah right now. Oakland, because of congestion and also the strikes there that we just, or the protests, I should say, not strikes. And then Savannah, just because it's taking so long to get on the berth in Savannah, there's just a massive pileup over there. LA, it should be LA and Long Beach. I don't know why they don't include Long Beach here. Long Beach, we're seeing the yellow right there, but everybody else is in the green right now with just New York, New Jersey having a little bit of a delay getting in. So a really interesting uh, examination. I like Lorianne Loraco's heat map. I like this a lot. I think it shows you what's going on across. Usually when I see that come out, I always put it out on my Twitter feed. If you don't follow me on Twitter, at Mercogliano S, M-E-R-C-O-G-L-I-A-N-O-S. All right, let's jump over to story number four. Story number four. So if you use gasoline and you have a piece of equipment that sits for a while, you know that if you use the older gasoline, it'll gum up. It, it, it just creates a bit of a problem. And so you get that newer fuel, which is much cleaner. Well, in 2020, the International Maritime Organization mandated a new fuel for vessels on the high sea, which was called very low sulfur fuel oil. It was the attempt by the IMO to decrease pollution, this case of sulfur. Uh, they couldn't handle carbon dioxide at the time, so they went with sulfur. And so January 1st, 2020, all vessels were supposed to either shift over to very low sulfur fuel oil or burn the high sulfur fuel oil. But if they burned it, they had to have this adapter modification done to their systems known as a scrubber. And basically what it did was scrub this, the sulfur out of the exhaust. Well, what we're finding out is because of the fuel crisis, and in case you had noticed, fuel is through the roof that that very low sulfur fuel is really friggin' expensive. However, the old fuel is cheaper, much cheaper, so much cheaper that if you're operating a scrubber, you've realized huge economic savings. Now, you're still paying more fuels up across the board, but you're not paying as much as you were if you're using the very low sulfur fuel. Story here by Greg Miller, ships that scrub emissions earn twice as much as those that don't. Average fuel spread recently topped $400 per ton, in some ports, $500 per ton. 
And that spread, which you see right here that Greg does in one of his great charts, Greg always has these great charts. I always love the charts that Greg puts out here. You'll see that spread here. You see the very low sulfur fuel oil way back in 2019. It dropped all of a sudden come with COVID. All of a sudden fuel oil drop. This is the spread. Blue shows you the spread here. It drops down very narrow spread here between the two. But as, again, all of a sudden shipping kicked back up and demand kicked back up, that spread began to really peak here. And then as you hit the Russia-Ukraine war, you see it really magnify so that now we're seeing this huge spread in dollars where the high sulfur fuel oil is a little bit over $200 per ton, whereas the very low sulfur is over $350 per ton. And what that means is a lot of shipping companies have fuel surcharges they can add to cargo, where if they're burning extra fuel for either speed or for cost, they can transfer that to the cargo, which means that you, the consumer, are footing that bill. And that means that goods are more expensive. Your purchasing power is going down. That's the technical definition for inflation. And this fuel cost is uh, associating with it. Now, eventually, that high sulfur fuel oil is going to go away. And they're going to mandate, I forget what the exact mandate is, when scrubbers have to go away. There's also a problem with scrubbers. And scrubbers don't last forever. They got to be periodically changed out. They have to go. You have to go to a shipyard to do that. That costs money. So the net savings with the scrubbers will eventually go away. And people will have to shift over to the low sulfur fuel oil. All right. Let's go ahead and head to our last story for the day. Last story of the day, I always pick a story that I find the most interesting and intriguing. And as what's going on with shipping is going on vacation for two weeks before the beginning of the school year, have no worries. I have recorded a ton of episodes that I'll be dropping periodically to keep you entertained. And I will be filming the what the ship for next week on the road from a undisclosed locale. But uh, we'll make sure to do it. And I do have my recording equipment so that if I need to drop a video for some breaking event, this is usually when ships go astray and I'm on the road. Uh, I'll be sure to be able to cover it. But this story right here from Mike Schuller over at GCAP struck me as I'm ready to head out on vacation. Officials urge caution after viral video shows humpback whale landing on a boat. So if you have not seen this yet, uh, let me go ahead and share it with you. That is a humpback whale landing on a sightseeing boat. Uh, humpback whales are some of the most amazing creatures ever to see, uh, but they are not meant to get very much close to. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, on vacation, if you ever find yourself out on, you know, you want to go watch whales and, and, and go, you know, see them in their natural environment, they're amazing. They're absolutely amazing. One of my favorite things I ever did on vessels was to see whales in their native habitat come alongside the vessel. I was on a ship where a whale bumped up alongside of us. They will do that every now and then. Uh, I've seen, you know, the dolphins on the bow going. Uh, but off of Massachusetts, there is a great whale sanctuary up there, uh, uh, a Stellwagen a bank, where the whales are all the time. And it, it's absolutely amazing to see them. However, you need to understand that these are wild creatures, mammals in, 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 in their home environment. And uh, they don't understand who you are and what you are. And, you know, there are minimum distance you need to keep from them. And I, I'm always shocked uh, on my honeymoon. I'll never forget going in Hawaii through the Maui Channel on a small boat. And I was told always that this is uh, whale breeding season. And that if you see a whale in the channel, just stop your boat, cut the propeller and just drift for a minute and don't antagonize the whale, uh, which I thought was funny until I saw a whale in the Maui Channel. And you realize how small you are compared to a whale in a boat. So one of the things I, I really want to stress on everyone, if you do want to go see whales, and I encourage you to go do it, do it with a tourist group, go with, you know, people who are recognized, who do this, who are familiar with it. Uh, don't get close to them. Uh, you're as likely to hurt them as they are to hurt you in some cases. 
Uh, that whale obviously uh, is not designed to land on a boat like that. Uh, obviously, it's not great for the boat either. But, you know, just respect the environment. Whales are amazing in their natural habitat. I, I love the ocean, everything about it. And when you see uh, mammals like that, fish too, in, in, in their natural habitat, it's great. You know, I, I, I preach the choir of, of, you know, what you bring out onto the ocean, you bring back to shore. You know, you don't dump anything in there. You don't leave anything in there. And again, always respect the ocean. Uh, water doesn't care about you. It doesn't. It is. It is. Uh, there. There is a old saying from my uh, uh, school. I went. I learned how to be a mariner, SUNY Maritime. You know, the sea is selective. It's slow in recognition of effort and aptitude, but fast in the sinking of the unfit. And that is true today as it was back then. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. Share it across social media. And if you can, if you can. Support the page. You can do it by two ways. One, hit that super thanks below button below and contribute to the channel. That allows me to bring these videos to you. And then second, go over to Patreon and become a patron of the page. That helps support the page. It allows me to uh, 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 subscribe to the news sources. If you don't know, uh, maritime news sources are expensive. None of them are cheap. Uh, there's a few that I show you all the time that are open source, which are great. Freightwave, Splash 24-7, G-Captain, absolutely phenomenal. But some of the other ones are pricey as anything, and you got to get through their paywall to get the maritime news. So if you can, that'd be great. If not, again, have a good one. I will be back soon, but plenty of episodes dropping on what's going on with shipping. Until next time, this is Sal signing off.